<laughs> it's not recording yet. There it is. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia Figelman. I'm one of the um, uh, education account managers here at Visual Sound. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar, it will be led by Corey Freed, and it is on center-based instruction through synchronous learning. A um, couple things of housekeeping. First of all, this uh, webinar is being recorded, and the recordings will be up on our website in the archive section a little bit later today. And also we ask that everyone just let us know, give us their email address um, in the chat box uh, so we can send resources as this call, um, when this call completes. Uh, Corey Freed is our fearless leader today and she is both Google and Microsoft, Learn Google and Microsoft certified and I am going to turn this over to Corey. All right, welcome everyone. I was about to mute everyone's mic, but it seems like everyone is ahead of me on that. If you need to come off of mute to talk or ask questions, please feel free. You could also ask questions in the chat box. Uh, Claudia and I will both be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, so that way we can answer all your questions. So today's workshop is on center-based instruction through synchronous learning. And center-based instruction is something that a lot of teachers do on a daily basis in their classroom. But the question is, how can we take that concept of center-based instruction and move it into the virtual world? Now, some people don't call it center-based. Some people call it small group instruction. I believe George told me he called it something else the other day. I forgot what you said, though. Um, but there, So there are different names for this type of learning, but the pedagogy is kind of the same for all. So what we're going to look at today is how can we take this small group learning and move it into that virtual setting. So basically the thing we need to start with is what is center-based instruction? And again, it's small groups. So you might have some students working independently. Sometimes you'll have them working on a STEM project or maybe science fair projects. Maybe you'll have them doing book reports or silent reading. You may have some students working in small groups. Now, again, this is asynchronous, meaning these small groups are the students working by themselves. Ah, station rotation, that is what George called it the other day. So some of these students may be working in small groups. You may have groups of three or four doing independent projects. And while all these students are working in their small groups, the teacher is going to be working with that one main group. And that one main group, the purpose of the teacher working with them is so that those students can get that more individualized attention so that they can really reach the higher levels that they, that we all know they can. And in station rotation, that's called the teacher led station. So thank you for that as well, George. Like I said, the vocabulary is different for different schools. The pedagogy tends to be about the same. We just call it different things. But it is, it is very good for me to learn what other people are calling it as well. So please feel free to keep putting those comments in. I love it. All right. So I did a sample schedule of what a fourth grade teacher might be doing when they're doing these small groups. So using Google Meet or Zoom or Microsoft Teams, however you're doing your video conferencing with students, this might be the teacher schedule, not the students. This is the teacher. So the teacher from 9 to 10 might have a small group for ELA. And in a fourth grade small group, they might be doing cause and effect. A really good way to do this in a small group is have the students tell each other a story. So the first student may say like a sentence or two, and then the next student continues and they keep growing on each other. So that way they're kind of seeing, well, if this student says this, now I have to change what I wanted to say, because obviously if student A said, we're going on a picnic, student B can't say something like, oh, the baseball game is awesome, unless they lead into it and say they're playing baseball at the picnic. So that cause and effect, that storytelling, it's just a fun way to kind of practice how that works. And then from 10 to 11, now you have a small group to teach math. And let's say in fourth grade right now, you're doing your coordinated planes, your X, Y, your positive negatives. There is a fun activity that I used to do in the classroom with my students, and it could very easily be updated to do it virtually, and that is play Battleship. If you guys remember the game Battleship, you have your, but normally you have your letters going up the side and your numbers going across the bottom, and you say like, A4, you sunk my Battleship. Well, 
you have the kids get out a piece of graph paper. They draw their ships on the graph paper. If you want to make sure they're not cheating as the teacher, maybe have them take a picture of their boards and send it to you. And then you could have them playing it. And as the teacher, you can be moderating, you can be correcting, you could be helping them all out with this. So that is a math lesson that you can be doing with your students. And it is just something fun for the kids where they're practicing the skills that you were just teaching them. Now, let's say from 11 to 12, you have another ELA group. Well, this time you have your lower kids, the ones that have a lot of struggling. So maybe you want to do a read aloud. So I am going to provide a link. A lot of publishers and authors have been giving permission to use their books for online read alouds. It is a gray area because of copyright, which is why I'm linking directly to the publisher's websites and you will have access to this. So you'll be able to go to this link right here that says approved publications. I'm also going to be putting that link into the resource page that I have been providing to teachers. JK Rawlings is one of the biggest ones that has given permission to read all the Harry Potter books. In fact, on one of the next slides, I have a screenshot of her tweet giving permission. So you will see that. Now from one to two, you want to do a STEM challenge with your kids. So these might be your higher level kids. You want to do some kind of coding lesson, but obviously you don't want to have them sitting on their computer. Well, they're going to be sitting on their computer with the webinar, but you don't want them typing code and stuff. So what you might have them do is program the teacher, show them a setting in the room, say, I need you to tell me exactly how to get from where I'm standing right now over to the light switch and you have to follow the kids' directions exactly. So if they say walk and they don't say stop, pretend to be walking into that door. So do exactly what the students tell you to do so that way they can see the cause and effect of programming. They can see that details matter, even something as simple as take two steps. Well, maybe take two baby steps instead of two normal steps, or maybe take two giant leaps instead of two normal steps. So purposely mess up as the fake robot but have the students program you and that again is a fun activity for both the teacher and the students it's teaching that computative thinking and it's just something to energize everyone you're all working together the teachers getting those lessons out the teachers getting the concepts the ideas and then the students would go off and do a private activity separately so like i said i did have a screenshot of the jk rawlings tweet she tweeted this out on march 20th Delighted to help teachers reach kids at home by relaxing usual license required to post videos of themselves reading the books. She does provide a link giving details because there are still rules involved. So this page right here is talking about some small ideas for ELA students. So when you have your ELA, obviously people think reading and writing, but there is other things you can do for ELA. So I wanted to just point those out to you. Collaborative videos. You could have your students, for example, if they're reading Romeo and Juliet, they can make a video of them reading it. I'm sure you guys have seen those videos where they look kind of like the Brady Bunch, a couple mini screens on the one big screen. There are a lot of softwares out there for students, and we can talk about those softwares as well, that, have, that are either normally free all the time or during this crazy crisis are giving their software away to schools for free. So it's very easy. Most of these softwares are point and click. So your students are going to have no problem making these videos. It may take from you like a 20 minute how to, and then the students explore it. And I guarantee you, they will blow you out of the water because kids love this creative stuff, but you can have them, like I said, make a Romeo and Juliet, or you can have them maybe take their favorite book and try to make a trailer for it. If it was becoming a movie. Whatever assignment you give them, they can make the videos on it. The peer editing. This is another really good one for small groups because it gets those students collaborating, but you don't necessarily need the teacher working with them in the moment. So for peer editing, they share their, doc their Google Docs or they share their Word Docs with each other and they can go and give each other feedback. Now there are ways on both Google and Microsoft that you can see the difference between the original writing and the feedback. So in Google Docs, you would just go up to the top. Instead of where it says edit, you would write feedback. 
and it would actually put it all in the comment section to the side. So even if they just fix someone's spelling, it puts it as a comment that says change lowercase i to uppercase i. And this way, the original student can see exactly what the recommendations are. In Microsoft, it is a tab on the top of your, of your uh, Microsoft document, and it says review. And the same concept as that Google review in Microsoft, it will put those links up there. So that way you can see what's going on and you can ag agree or disagree with the recommendations of your editor. So now we have some small group STEM ideas. When we are talking about STEM, I mentioned this one earlier, logical directions, computative thinking. This is stuff that is amazing that we can be doing with students. That doesn't require technology because it's giving them the concept of, well, how do I program something? You have to pretend that the robot doesn't know anything. As I said before, what, what size is a step? Is it small? Is it big? You have to give it such exact directions. And this is somewhere that your parents will love you for this one, because instead of just having the kids program the teacher, have the kids write directions for everyday tasks and then practice those directions. So in my example, I have folding a shirt. Well, if the kids have to try folding a shirt to figure out the steps, they're going to be doing the laundry for their mom. And mom's going to be happy that they're doing the laundry. Teacher's going to be happy because the kids are learning computative thinking. And the kid is going to think, oh, I'm learning how to program. I didn't even realize I did the laundry. It's the whole Tom Sawyer white fence, right? So these are some ideas that you can do with your students. If you have them write these directions down, next step, have them share it with a classmate. And now the classmate tries to follow the steps step by step and see, was I able to fold my shirt? The other idea that I put up here for small group STEM ideas is give them a basic problem that they can kind of test with items at home. So this example I put is the oil spill. Have them put a little bit of water and a little bit of oil in a cup and see if they can find pieces of equipment at home where they can get the oil out of the water and have them record the attempts, share out what they did with each other, and then maybe incorporate some ELA into this by finding some current events about oil spills in the oceans. Luckily, we have not had many current events of that. However, if you go back a year or two, the BP oil spill, the oil in, in uh, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden, in Alaska. So there are plenty of, within the last five years current events, there might luckily not be any within the last like six months. But you can have the students do all this. Now a little disclaimer on this activity, because right now there are so many issues with groceries and all of those type of things, don't force them to use oil from their kitchen if their parents like barely have any left. Don't force them to use paper towel because we know that that's, you know, running low. You could say to the students, if you don't have supplies, draw pictures of what you would do. Prototype it with cardboard or however they can do it from home to get the idea across of what they think would work. So those are just some ideas for STEM. And then for social studies. For social studies, one of the biggest things would probably be the virtual field trips. And we are going to actually be planning a separate webinar on virtual field trips because this is a topic that a few people have asked about in, current of, in um, office hours. So I will be doing a virtual field trip coming up probably next week or the week after. As soon as we get the schedule, it will be posted on the Visual Sound website for you so you'll know when this is coming. But the virtual field trip passives. There are a lot of museums and zoos and even the ISS up in space right now that are organizing virtual field trips where they tell on their website like, hey, at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, we're going to be doing this or at 9 a.m. Eastern time, we're going to be doing this. And you just schedule for all your students to join at the same time. They participate in the field trip. And then you could do a debrief as a class after or a debrief as a small group. You could also take them on your own field trips. Google has the cultural center where you can take full field trips, 360 of museums from around the world. So you can pull that up on your screen in a webcast 
talk to your students. So take them to the Mona Lisa, take them to the Eiffel Tower, take them to Buckingham Palace. You can take them without physically leaving any space. And then the second idea for the small groups is let the students create their own virtual field trips. Let them look up pictures, let them create. It doesn't necessarily have to be 360. So they can make a Google slide or a PowerPoint of Disney World. And then they can make a vi virtual field trip and show their student, show their classmates. So the passive is where you as the teacher are just taking your students along for the ride. The active is where the students are actually becoming the creators and the designers of these experiences. And then the final small group idea for social studies is current events. There are tons of things going on in the world right now. You don't have to focus on this one major crisis because there are other things going on. So you as the social studies teacher know your students, know what you need to do, but have like a current events, bring up a press conference, bring up an article, discuss it with your students. Even the little kids, even the elementary school students, they know what's going on. They're not ignoring the news. Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, they're all focusing on this news right now. So don't shy away from it. Discuss it with your students. Educate them on what's going on. So that is a huge idea is current events for social studies. And again, you know your students, so you know what they can and can't handle. And another reason why this might be a good small group idea is because you can do simpler articles with your lower level kids. You can do more complex concepts with your higher level kids and you can get to all the students at their own levels. So we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to open the floor to questions now. I could also pull up some resources if you would like to see, for example, the Google um, cultural experiences and all of those. Feel free to come off of mute if you'd like, or just type your questions in the text box. Could you show the um, in the Google Classroom or the um, the Google Suite the um, cultural? Yep, I was actually pulling it up because I had a feeling you were going to ask, George. Okay. You are on top of stuff today. It's early. It's early. That's why you're on top of stuff today. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me uh, take this out of full screen and pull in so the website for art and culture is actually artandculture.google that is the website and here you'll see all of these experiences now if your students have google cardboard at home they can see these in 360 they can also see it in 360 on their phone so we're going to look right here at the hubble telescope because it's one of the ones on the front page make it a little easier for me to get to it for this demonstration. So here is the Hubble telescope. And as you scroll through, it gives you facts about it. It gives you pictures. Notice that this is a 360 picture. I can move it around a little bit. So that's what I mean when I say if they had the phone with, the, with a virtual reality goggle, they can actually view this stuff in 360. It zooms in to show the details. It takes you to more pictures. It gives the teacher facts about it. It gives the students facts about it. So these are all like really great things. Now I did mention like the Eiffel Tower and stuff. So I will show if you go to explore. Here is where you can get all of this content and you can go. Here's mediums. Here's art movements. Here's historical events. Scroll down even farther and you can get to the museums. If you can't find the specific museum you're looking for, because obviously it's never where it, where you think it's going to be when you're demonstrating something, you could pull up the search, type in something, and now here are different articles about the Mona Lisa. Here's different pictures. They have an entire Leonardo da Vinci section. Portraits. So this is all stuff that you can do with your students. And this art and culture is completely free. You don't even need to have a Google account for it. So if your school is Microsoft, you can still access this. Did I say there was a place to go in the waffle? No, I did not mention the waffle. Unfortunately, art and culture is not in the waffle. Okay. For those of you curious what he's referring to in his question, this up here by some school districts is referred to as the waffle. 
I call it the Rubik's Cube, but again, everyone's different. So normally when you click on those nine little dots, it will pull up a menu. So of course it's not pulling it up from the culture, but if I go back to my Google Doc, or if I just go back to Google as a whole, the waffle is normally where you have your shortcuts. So you'd have your Google Drive, you'd have your calendar. Because you guys have education accounts, you probably see an icon for classroom. Those are all the shortcuts. Unfortunately, art and culture does not have a shortcut for that. Now, if you wanted to design your own field trips with your students, one option, and this one would require a Google account, is mymaps.google. Mm -hmm. Mymaps.google is going to open Google Maps, and it's going to let your students basically create a map over Google Map. So, for example, if I want to type in Disneyland, I can find Disneyland in Anaheim, California. And if I click the add to my map, it now gives me a layer that says Disney. I can now edit it on my own. So I could say like first stop of the field trip. And then have my students put a little fact about Disneyland. How will they each have a separate um, place to put that? Oh, that is an excellent question, George. So just like all of your other Google Docs and Google Files, my maps save to your Google Drive. So you can access it from Google Drive and you can collaborate on it just like every other Google Doc. How do you, how do you save that? It saves automatically. So as you can see, when I scroll down to my files, there is an untitled map because I obviously did not title my map. If I wanted to title my map, I would come here and I would write webinar demo. I'd save it. Now the file saved. I can click share. And again, just like all my other Google Docs, I could set it so people can edit it, people can view it, uh -huh. however I want to set the requirements. So this can be a group project. This could be an individual project. I have seen some teachers actually use this. They assign each student a separate president and the students go onto a collaborative map and they put where the president was born and then an interesting fact about that president. So there are tons of different things you can do with these maps, create those field trips. It's, it's just one of those fun interactive activities that you can do with your students. Do we have any other questions from the crowd? Corey, I have to go resharpen my pencil and go to my other one. Have fun at your other webinar. This will be recorded and uploaded later. So if there are other questions, you can watch them at your own convenience. Okay. And, and as them. you know, office hours, you could always come back in. I probably will. I have a couple questions. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Does anyone else have any questions? Could you share that um, that STEM slide again? Yes, I, I could write some notes and I didn't. I didn't. Oh, of course, it. and it will be on the resource as well after. Okay. So the other website that I was just pulling in here is called Tor Builder. It's sort of similar to Google Maps, but it's a little more in depth. I wouldn't really recommend it for younger kids because it does have a bit of a learning curve to it. But for your high school students, it is much more visually stunning than just making a map, which is why I was going to recommend it for you. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I, I want you to ask questions. I just don't want to fill the time with empty space. So I want to give you as many resources as I can if there were no questions. So there is the center-based instruction for STEM ideas. And now if you were in my STEM from home webinar last week, I did mm -hmm. give another resource that was design. Um, I keep forgetting the name of the website. That's why I keep calling oh, it design. Yeah. It's on the, it's on the resource list. It, it creates, um, it, it creates ongoing repetitive STEM ideas. Yeah. So that it was, um, build stuff. it was cool. It was. Where was that? I was on that one. Like I said, it is on the resource page. 
And there is the link for the resource. I spelled bit.ly wrong, so that link is wrong. I apologize. Where's the, where's the link? All right, so this one, the second link that I just posted because I spelled bit wrong in the first. The bit.ly oh, visual that. sound 031. If you go down to STEM resources, you will find the link that mm -hmm. I was mentioning that I can't think of the name off the top of my head. It is design something. And it is a great resource because it just creates random things for your students. And yeah. like I was saying with like the oil spill, oh, sharpen design. There we go. Right. And it's the same idea. If your students don't have the supplies, don't penalize them for not being able to physically build something. But right. have them draw it, have them describe it. They can write a description, draw a description, turn, make a video and just explain the description. There are so many ways that you can do something like this with your students. Right. And, oh, I should leave that up because you were taking notes on that slide. Nice. So do we have any other questions? Again, this is being recorded, so a copy will be uploaded later today to our YouTube channel, and the link will be put in the playlist on the Visual Sound website. So you could always go back and refer to it. That bit.ly will also have a copy of the video along with other resources. I am growing that Google Doc all the time, so if you check back, there could be new resources tomorrow that are not there today. As always, we appreciate your time and I hope you got something wonderful out of this webinar. If I will stay around for a little bit if you have any additional questions. And I do have office hours today from 10 to one. You are more than welcome to stop by during that time. It is the same link that you used to come in today to the webinar. And I will be around to answer questions about any technology for your classroom, any websites, any pro softwares, any programs, whatever you need help with, I'm here for you. Thank you so much. All right, I am gonna turn off the video because I think we are pretty much done with the webinar, but again, I'm not leaving right away, so I am here if you need me. <laughs>